Yeah, I've traveled all the way from Lean Shopping, so I'm very jet lagged. <laughs> but I am also at Decision Research, which is in Eugene, Oregon. Ellen used to be a part of Decision Research, and Ola Svensson is a part of Decision Research. Uh, but today I travel from, from Lean Shopping. So I am actually going to, to do a kind of a broad presentation on what I call information neglect. Uh, in judgment and decision making. And I'm going to exemplify that with research that we have been doing at Jedi Lab, which is the judgment, emotion, decision, intuition lab in Lean Shopping, uh, on charitable giving and the role of emotion and deliberation in charitable giving. And there will be a, a component of this talk on motivated reasoning, but I'm hoping to expand on that concept a bit. Also, I'm really worried that my talk is going to be just a much worse vers version of Ellen's talk <laughs> because we worked <laughs> together for a very long time. <laughs> uh, and so you just have to bear with me and just remember how good Ellen's talk was <laughs> whenever I, I mess up. Okay, so uh, I borrowing the term homo ignorance from Ralph Hertwig, who talks about homo ignorance as the ignorant man which is in opposition to Homo economicus, the, the economic man. And, and uh, <coughs> Homo ignorance is really a person who doesn't uh, use information when it's available. According to Homo economicus theory, information is usually quite good, especially if it's non-costly. It's actually utility in some sense. But we know that people many times actively avoid information, so information avoidance. We know that, and we've seen several examples of that already here today, distort information so that it suits their beliefs and worldviews. But also, and I think this is maybe the biggest issue, that we don't attempt to information, even though it's there and it's relevant to us. And so I'm going to try to talk about all these three components, the active avoidance of information, the distortion of information, but also the, the, the inattention to relevant information in decision making. So I, the, the umbrella term that I use is um, information neglect. So uh, we have a, a pretty big research program where we look at when and why do people neglect information that is not attempt to distort and avoid information in different contexts. So I do work with Ellen and Paul Slovak and others in a humanita humanitarian context, so about charitable giving. Why do we donate to some causes and why do we ignore other causes? And that's going to be the, 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 the thing that I'm focusing on in my talk here today. But we also do this in other contexts like financial decision making and healthcare decisions. And we've heard already and you all know about the two systems of thinking. But I wanted to show that here again. This is, of course, what, what Kahneman, fast and slow, thinking fast and slow. It's important because it's actually two modes of thinking, both system one, which is based on feelings and affect and, and intuition, that's a way of thinking. And then we have this more slow, recent, logical, deliberative system. Uh, that's also another way of thinking. And, and both these uh, systems, in a way, influence the way that we make decisions and process um, information. And as Ellen pointed out, uh, maybe system two is better to deal with symbols, numbers, and rules, and system one is better with stories and narratives and, and, and such things. Uh, just as an example, I think most of you can decode the emotion that this person is expressing very quickly. Very few of you can solve this very quickly, which is a system two task you need to, you know, I couldn't solve this ever, probably. <laughs> And, and you may need some calculator or some help or, you know, something. You need really different type of processing. And as Ellen already has shown, system one is not really awesome when it comes to counting. So here's a study that I like to show. It's uh, from Chernobyl and Shandov. It's a between subject study where they ask participants to do a very strange task in a way. They're asked to estimate the calorie content of a dish. So one group gets a burger and we know that that's bad. So on average, you know, we say 710 cal calories. Another group of participants get broccoli. We know that's good. So on average, 60 calories. Then the magical thing happens, of course, is when you combine the burger and broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, now you have 660 calories. And the estimation there is a numeric task, but you use your feelings. And you know that burger is bad. 
broccoli is good. If you add something good to something, something that's bad, then it becomes a little bit better. And I think we all do this all the time, right? So here's a, a clear situation, I think, when uh, we try to use our feelings as information to inform a decision, and in the end, we will end up eating more calories, even though we will feel good and healthy about our choice. So there are some important limits of what I call the affective calculus. So we know that affect is really good and necessary for many decisions, uh, especially when we have experience, um, and it gives meaning to information, but it's much less suited for these type of system two tasks or decisions. And I think important for motivated thinking is the, the, the fact that affect is all about good and bad. Quickly decide whether something is good or bad for me, whether it's threatening me uh, or something that I should approach or avoid. Whereas cognition is all about true and false. And the problem with, for instance, fake news is that we often use our feelings and mis misattribute our feelings um, as good being true and bad being false. So we may oftentimes, and I think this is a different pathway than Gordon talked about, which is reasoning. This may be a more emotion-based way of reaching you know, true or false um, conclusions. So what I want to do today, and I, I have to apologize for two things. I might have a very short talk or a very long talk. I don't know. It might be 30 minutes or three hours and 30 minutes. So I, I, <laughs> I may skip slides or I may talk for a very long time about the last slide. We'll see. Uh, the other thing I will uh, have to apologize is that if you have a distribution of people who are sweating, I'm at the 110th percentile. So I'm going to wipe my forehead every now and then. It's just me. Okay, so if we go back to the system one, system two approach, we could think about, I'm not saying motivated reasoning, I'm saying motivated thinking. Could be fast and slow, could be system one and system two. So in, in the paper that also I mentioned before, we talk about two, system, uh, two ways that, that motivated thinking can occur. Either motivated thinking as feelings, so it could be abilities, system one abilities, uh, that lead to biased thinking. Or it could be motivated thinking as analysis, which is more what we saw from the previous presentations, typically the Dan Kahn study, where numeracy or other cognitive abilities increased biased thinking. And I think both those pathways are important. And we typically tend to focus very much on this motivated thinking as analysis. And I think it's worth to explore this other motivated thinking as feelings as a a potential pathway as well for uh, motivated thinking. Motivated thinking as feelings could be, for instance, when you downregulate, and I will show some examples of that, your feelings. When you get information about the vast need of the many people in the world who are suffering, and you downregulate your compassion, that could be a form of motivated downregulation of your feelings. And I will spend uh, a large chunk of my talk about that type of neglect and, and system one um, motivated downregulation of feelings. But importantly, both these sort of system one and system two uh, motivated thinking, they come about in the interaction between task characteristics. So if the task is numeric, then there will be a fit where you know, motivated thinking as analysis is more likely to occur. But if the task or decision is not numeric, then, well, of course, Numeracy will matter less. It might still be important, but matter less. So that's important to think about. Uh, Ellen mentioned affect rich and affect poor. And of course, as soon as affect is, has entered into the picture, we will have this more motivated thinking as feelings potentially be important. Uh, individual differences. We've talked about the cognitive reflection task. We talked about numeracy. There's a broader term that this conference is, is using cognitive capacity, which could be a lot of different things in addition to numeracy and, and cognitive reflection task. Uh, but there's also important emotional abilities that differ between people. How much we experience emotion, how much we regulate our emotion, how good we are at regulating our emotion, how much we rely on affect or emotion when we make judgments. So all those individual differences are potentially also important. And so I would like to extend 
the concept of cognitive capacity to also include, include those type of abilities. And then, of course, we have situational factors. So under time pressure, cognitive load, you have less available resources and need to very quickly and heuristically respond to a situation. Uh, some positions are more utilitarian, buying a calculator. Some are more hedonic, you know, figuring out what chocolate is the best to bring back from Sweden. Uh, and familiarity with the, the, the situation. So I will use that as sort of a background and framework and now go into some research that we've been doing in the humanitarian context. Because in the humanitarian context, it's clear that we have a lot of information available. Some of it is numeric, a lot of it is non-numeric. Uh, we know also from just looking at the vast need in the world today that we ignore or neglect a lot of problems that could be fixed by us. Uh, for some reason, we avoid, we do not engage with, we don't attend to, and we may even distort information about suffering of other people. Well, if we only engaged, if we didn't distort, we could be able to help those people. And if we just take, so we're getting close to, to Christmas, so we will see these types of appeals all the time. But if you just take an appeal like this, there's a lot of information in this simple appeal. There's emotional information, there's more sort of system two or analytic information. There's a, an identified child. There's statistics here. One homeless child at Christmas is a tragedy. 80,000 of them is a disgrace. And there's various action buttons and, and colors and things like that that will appeal to feelings and, and uh, behaviors. But if you're a person going into this situation and you for some reason have decided that, uh, you know, I'm not going to care about these issues, that you may even avoid engaging at all. You may turn away. You may not look at this information. When it pops up in your, uh, on Facebook, you will just scroll uh, to the next page, or you will turn the page of, of, of uh, uh, the newspaper, or you walk to the other side of the street. But also, if, even if you attend to this, you're going to attend to some information preferentially over other information. So we know, for instance, that there's a strong sort of capture here with a person, the child, that's going to capture your attention. We have Andreas Olsen here is doing that type of research. We know that a face in a crowd is going to can catch your attention and, and draw you in here. Uh, whereas maybe at the expense, as Ellen talked about, that we don't pay attention to the statistics. Whereas some people may be very uh, focused on statistical information and facts and maybe more focused on that and then not attend to the emotional content of this. Some people may even use wishful or motivated thinking in some sense and say that, you know, I really don't want to donate. So I can manipulate the statistics here and say that one out of 80,000, that's pretty bad. That's not very effective. I can only help this one child, but there's, you know, 79,999 that won't be helped. And I could use that to kind of bolster my decision, uh, boost my decision to, to not donate in this case. So I think a simple case like this shows these different types of just passive inattention, active avoidance, and also, in some sense, motivated thinking. And I want to give some examples, and this will be very similar to some of the, the stuff that Ellen has shown uh, that we've done. The first study is actually a set of studies where we looked at motivated thinking or information distortion for refugee statistics. So it's the Kahan type of, of study, but we've adapted it to a Swedish context. And we have uh, looked at a, a, a problem that's very important in a Swedish context, and that is whether we should accept or reject refugees coming into Sweden. Uh, I will also, after that, show some examples of research that we've done looking at information selection after you made a choice, and also information avoidance before making a shareable, charitable decision. So uh, Ellen has already shown this. And this, this, this is the price that you have to pay if you prepare your presentations, like 
and I was just hours before giving the presentation, I have not coordinated at all with you, Ellen. And for that reason, I'm going to show you kind of the same <laughs> graph here again. So this is the, the, the rash, uh, the skin cream problem that Ellen showed before. And it's a simple decision like that. So just to remind people that all you have to do is a simple uh, uh, ratio here. And it's, it's not a simple math problem, but you know, you can figure that out probably. But you're not asked to actually do the math problem. You're just asked to say, you know, did it increase or decrease? Did it work or didn't work? That's all you have to do as a subject in this study. Uh, and so what we did, which actually goes back to one of the questions, is that we, we took the, the Cahan study. This is our control condition. And then the next slide will be a very busy slide. Uh, even highly numerates won't make it this time, but, but let's try it. Uh, <laughs> what we did is basically, it's the same kind of math problem again. So down here we have two, the two skin problems. The only difference is that we have switched the, 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 the labels here. So sometimes the rash actually increase as a function of using the skin cream. And sometimes the rash uh, decrease, sorry, it should be decrease there. Uh, what we then have is a politically motivated scenario. And instead of gun control, as Ellen and Dan used, we use uh, refugees. And what we have here is actually, we didn't use the Swedish context because we didn't want to have too much of identification, but we used uh, our worst neighbor, Norway, uh, as an example, giving this scenario to Swedish respondents. So what you have here is simply crime rate has either decreased or increased as a function of whether you have taken in refugees during the last five years or not. So it's exactly the same as the skin cream problem, but now it's in a potentially politically uh, polarizing domain. And uh, as you see here also, we have different numbers here because we've actually did this within the subject comparison. So people all, always saw both the crime and the rash, but they all, if they saw the increase, in crime, they saw then the rash decrease, it should say decrease there. So we actually have that in different orders as well. So sometimes we begin with the crime, and sometimes we begin with the skin cream. And what we find in general there is, uh, I mean, we don't really find any strong order effects. You, don't, you can't devise bias motivated reasoning by starting with the neutral. Um, so I think that's similar to, to what, what you said. <sighs> then uh, the trick, of course, to get this, we had uh, a large representative sample, a thousand Swedish participants. And instead of asking whether, you know, whether the um, skin cream increased or decreased, um, worked or didn't work, we ask our subjects in the, in the crime scenarios to just simply say whether crime has increased or decreased. So the idea here is that we should see no difference between groups, the, the, no matter how we div divide the groups, for the neutral scenarios, but we're going to see a difference in the politically charged scenarios, a little bit depending on what we measure and use as a polarizing var variable. We measured a bunch of things, but the thing that we ended up using as the main uh, polarizingly dividing uh, variable, individual differences in whether you see yourself as a Swede or a world citizen. So this is a scale that says that people sometimes talk about whether they view themselves as world citizens or as Swedes. People who view themselves as world citizens believe that all people should have equal rights at, and, that, and that we have a common responsibility to, to help everybody, no matter their nationality. People who view themselves as Swedes believe that Swedish citizens should have some privileges and that, and that they have a greater responsibility to help Swedes than people from other countries. And then it's just a continuous scale or you can indicate whether you're absolutely agreeing with being a Swede or absolutely agreeing with uh, being a global citizen. And then uh, we measured numeracy. Well, depending on who we ask, we measured some version of numeracy and some version of cognitive reflection task. Actually, the last three items in our numeracy scale is the three first items in the original cognitive reflection task. And then it's a mix of different scales, uh, but they're all sort of math related. And what you see here is just a percentage in our sample responding correctly. So for instance, with the CRT, we only had like 25% with a bat on the ball that answered that correctly. And we see that we get a lot of variance. We could use just the three first 
pure numeracy items uh, and compare that to the CRT and we don't get much of a difference. So what we did was that, that we just combined that into one scale. So we will have a scale where individual differences in numeracy is number of correct answers to these six questions going from zero to six, basically. Okay, so here are, I'm sorry about that it's so very bright and light, and, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. So here are the two skin cream, um, two skin cream conditions, either increase or decrease. And there's no difference between Swedes or those that say that they're world citizens. But we do find uh, a difference between Swedes and world citizens consistent with their worldview. So if you're a Swedish oriented, um, cry increased and you're more correct. Uh, right. No, the other way around. Yeah, oh, that, that's right. Swedish, Swedish oriented and the, and the scenario is that crime has increased as a function of refugees, you're more correct. And if crime decreased, the Swedish oriented are less correct. And the other way around then, of course, then the globally oriented are more correct. Um, so we do find, uh, in some sense, a replication of the main findings of the Cajon study, where we see this form of motivated thinking uh, so that in a in a highly um, political, uh, for a highly political scenario, people differ in their ability to solve this math problem. What we don't find, uh, in contrast to to Ellen's and, and Dan's study, is that <laughs> we don't really find this increasing effect of numeracy. So remember that among the high numerates, they were really the ones showing the, the strong motivated reasoning or motivated numeracy in this case. So what we have is the numeracy scores. So here is basically a person who has no idea about math. This is someone who's scoring quite well. And then the two lines are just whether you're scoring as nationally oriented and globally oriented. And this is just for one of the two, one of the two scenarios. Uh, but it looks very similar for the crime decrease, just that the, the two um, lines flip then. What, so, I mean, it looks like there's a difference here, but there, there's an equally big difference down here. So we don't, overall find a very strong uh, effect of mo motivated numeracy. Instead, we find, if anything, that there's no effect or maybe that higher numeracy overall just leads you to make more correct responses. Uh, so we follow this up with another study. So this is published uh, last year in Behavioral Public Policy. So we follow this up with a few new studies um, that aren't published yet, but that I'll show to you. So one of the things that we were interested in doing was to see if we could increase motivated reasoning by limiting people's ability to reason. So we have done a series of studies using time pressure. Um, Gordon also talked about studies doing that. So typically when you put people under time pressure, they become much more heuristic in their responding. They use heuristics and they don't have those system two capabilities that they can sort of rely on. Uh, so our thing here was that if we use a similar type of numeric scenario as we did in, in our first study, but now we put time pressure versus no time pressure. So we did uh, a lot of pilot testing to figure out how long time it will take people to do this math problem so that we would actually put a limit so it would still be a time you know, a, a, a pressing task to, to finish this. Uh, what we found out was that if we limit people, so you have a counter pretty much just ticking down, saying so that you have 45 seconds to do this math problem, then people didn't always finish and they felt very sort of uh, pressed for time. So our time pressure is very different from usual time pressure studies, which are typically super quick, like decide now. But because of the nature of the task, you still have to do, read the scenario and do the math we, our time pressure is respond within 45 seconds. And then our no time pressure is take how much time you want to do this. Uh, we have a, a very big study, uh, we, again, with a representative sample online Swedish participants. We used the same kind of scenario that we had in study one, but a bunch of others. So this is highly within subject as well. So we have uh, the, the skin rash as neutral. We have the, the um, refugee immigration, crime, um, 
and then we have some other with gender quota and things that might be in other ways um, highly uh, politicized. Be, again, Mr. Numeracy and the Swede world citizen. So I'm just going to present some results relating to the, the um, crime from refugees here. So we thought that time pressure could increase motivated thinking uh, because, well, simply you don't have time to think and correct, so you're going to make more errors in a sense. And maybe if the motivated numeracy effect is there, maybe we would see a stronger influence now of numeracy under time pressure than under no time pressure. I mean, you could have other hypotheses too, but those were the ones that we pre-registered, so I'm sticking with those. So if you look here, these are just the main effects. If we, if we just look uh, across both time pressure, no time pressure. So this is again, the control condition. We find no difference between the two groups. And this is for the decreased crime. We find again in the right direction, some, some um, uh, evidence here for motivated reasoning. So that the, those that are globally oriented are more correct when the immigration uh, scenario says that it decreases crime. Uh, so that's good. We can replicate the first study in a sense. Uh, but what about the effects of time pressure and numeracy? Well, interestingly, we find an effect of time pressure, but it's just the main effect. So that when I'm put under time pressure, people just make more errors. And that's a very, very clear and significant effect. But there's no interaction or there's no effect on motivated thinking. So you don't see this. What we would have expected here possibly is that this difference would have been bigger than. But that we don't see, they're completely parallel lines. And again, uh, we fail to find any support for motivated numeracy. What I'm showing here is just numeracy across both time pressure and no time pressure, but it doesn't matter how you slice it, there's no interaction either. Uh, here, there is actually a significant interaction in that there is, at lower levels of numeracy, a difference, but that difference actually disappears at higher levels of numeracy. So that's very different from the, the original Cajon study. So, uh, so far, we've, we've done those studies. This is not published yet, but there's a soon uh, a working paper available. If you ask system, System one, it will be ready any day. Uh, <laughs> according to system two, it might take a bit longer, but just email me if you want to have access to this. We'll put it up on Sci Archive or something. We've also tried to extend this into other domains. So uh, here's just an example from our financial project. So, so now, again, we use the same kind of Cajon um, or um, the, the, the Cajon type of, of scenario where it's a numeric task. We actually use the same numbers, but now what we look at instead is whether investments in stocks has increased or decreased, depending on if it's a green ethical stock or a regular stock. And then we measure numeracy as before. We also measure financial literacy, which is a horrible measure in so many ways, but it's basically similar in a sense and correlated with numeracy, but not very highly, uh, but there's a correlation. Basically, it's your knowledge about um, uh, how you know, uh, economic matters work, but there's also some amount of math going into this. So for instance, suppose you had $100 in a savings account and the interest rate was 2% per year. After five years, how much do you think you would have in the account if you left the money to grow? And then you have to pick one of those. And typically, <coughs> what you see if you measure financial literacy is that that's related to in general, better financial well-being and outcomes. Um, so we had this here as, a, as another sort of supplementary measure to numeracy. And then we measured uh, the globally dividing individual difference measure here was whether you really thought that it's good if the, the economy is benefited from whatever, or whether the environment should benefit from whatever you're doing. So we, we call it econ green orientation. So again, uh, we can see the same kind of effect. So here's the rash control condition, and here's the uh, green versus, uh, yeah, the number of correct uh, responses depending on whether you're categorizing yourself as someone who cares about the environment 
or whether you care more about making money, basically. Uh, so what we find here is, again, a sort of a main effect motivated reasoning, but neither financial literacy and numeracy does anything else than just increase the number of correct responses. So if you're higher on financial literacy and higher on numeracy, and especially the combination of both, then you're just doing this more correctly. So we don't find uh, here either any evidence for this sort of motivated uh, numeracy. All these studies, by the way, were done of, uh, in Sweden with Swedish subjects with you know, uh, scenarios that would be applicable to a Swedish context in some sense. Sense, but I think that what we see is this, at least at a, as a main effect, we see this distorted information processing that's consistent with worldviews for both political and financial scenarios. We don't really find other effects of individual differences than just a general main effect, so that pushes up. You know, you, if you have high cognitive capacity, you're going to make less errors. And so I think a very important thing here for future research is to try to understand the boundary conditions. Why do we not find this motivated numeracy? And why do Cahan and several studies find this motivated numeracy? What are the boundary conditions? We haven't been able to figure that out yet. Um, and this is just from one study, but time pressure, uh, of course, had a, a main effect, but it did very little to increase motivated reasoning in our study. So those are all examples, and I departed a bit from the humanitarian context with throwing in some, some financial decisions here, but, but going from this motivated thinking, I would like to just spend some time talking about what I think is, is even more important than motivated thinking when it comes to charitable giving, is information avoidance and selective information seeking. I think we attend too little to information that's supposed to be or should be relevant to us when we make decisions about whom to help. And a lot of this could be understood by uh, how we weight information. So given that we have, as we showed earlier in this, in this uh, uh, charity ad, there's a lot of information. How do we weight that information when making a decision whether to donate or not to that child? So I would like to spend a, a bit of time here just talking about, again, system one, system two, in producing information avoidance and selective information seeking when it comes to shareable, charitable causes. And if time, if I have time, I think I will have time, uh, I will talk about some new data on how we can debias uh, this type of inattention. So the first thing I want to show here is a study that my one of my grad students, but Anderson did, which is a very simple, simple study. He was just interested in, will people, if given the chance, when making a charitable decision, look at information that might be relevant for their decision? So you don't have to read all of this, <laughs> but basically this is a charity ad. So this is a study not done in Sweden, but on Amturk. So participants were paid for another study and then we gave them a windfall bonus. Here's an extra dollar. And then we gave them a real charity cost. So there's, some, there's an image, there's some information about what the money goes to. And then uh, we simply asked people to donate out of that one additional dollar that they got, any amount that they wanted from zero to, from zero to one dollar. And the special part about this study then is that we had this just show like this. If you want to know how much others in your situation have donated on average to a similar organization, you can click this text. So it's very low cost. You can click this. And if you click this, it would show, it says here, other people in your situation have donated 61 cent on average. So a simple click and you can get social information. And many times people like social information. We know that social nudges are some of the more effective nudges when you give information about how other people behave. You start to behave in that way too. But interestingly, we find that only 40% in our um, sample reveal that information. Of course, this is M Turkers. They just want to run through this study as quickly as possible. But importantly, because this was a very high anchor, 61%, that had a downstream effect on donations. 
So people that show the information donated significantly more. It's still way below the 61 cent. It's only 30, 33 cents or something on average. But it's really significantly more than those that didn't show that information. And so one of the reasons we think that, that people don't want to look at this information is that they have already decided that I'm going to keep the money for myself. So we're doing variants and versions of this study now uh, where we um, try to look at both individual differences but also mechanisms as to why people would avoid this information even though it might be irrelevant for them. I can see many reasons why I would avoid that information. Um, we are also, by the way, varying the anchor. So sometimes it's a very low anchor and sometimes it's a very high anchor. And it seems to, to affect, of course, the donation amounts. So one effect that, that we've recently resurrected from post old research is the, the notion of prominence. And that is that when you make decisions, you neglect certain information that before that even before making the decision might seem important to you. So for instance, we've looked at this decision. People need to make a trade-off between national security and foreign lives when, when they're asked to accept refugees into the country. When you ask people about their values, they often value both these things very highly. National security is super important, but also human lives, very important. But what we have found is that when people then are asked to make a decision, all of a sudden, very selectively, people pay attention to the most prominent attribute. And in this case, the most prominent attribute many times is national security, which could lead to, of course, that we uh, don't really pay attention to the scope of a problem. We can ignore how many foreign lives we can save because all we're focusing on is just you know, minimizing a low risk that the national security is threatened. <laughs> so we've done a, a study uh, together with Alex Garinter and Marcus Mayorga. We did a study in the US where people could just select information about a decision whether to accept or reject uh, refugees into their community. So you first make a decision, read about the scenario where, where what the family is and how it's going to be located in your, in your uh, community. And then after making the decision, which is just accept and reject, you're, you're allowed to just look at how many information pieces you want to by clicking a box that, that either pertain to human, uh, humanitarian concerns or security concerns. So the red bars are security concerns and the blue bars are, are humanitarian concerns. And then we have acceptors and rejectors. These are two studies. What we see, which is very interesting, I think, is that no matter if you accept or reject refugees, national security is important. That's the red bars. They look at that, think that that's super important. There's really, there's some differences, but the real difference is that the acceptors those that say yes to accept refugees also look at the humanitarian items to a much higher degree than those that reject the, the refugees. So you can think of this as, as a form of choice supportive decision process or consolidation, I guess Ola would say, uh, that would support your decision that you already made. Now, I've said that I, wanna, I don't want them here. I don't want the refugees here. I don't really want to learn about the humanitarian reasons, humanitarian reasons why I should have them here. So, overweighting and underweighting on information is really important. Ellen has already talked about both scope neglect and probability neglect. Uh, but I think especially scope neglect has a special meaning and importance in the pro-social domain. And a very important question for us is that many of the effects that we see may be due to overweighting of certain information and underweighting of other information. Can we in some way redirect people's attention so that they better integrate the relevant information? before making a, de a decision. So we have uh, 
in a series of studies looked at three effects, which I think all show neglect for relevant information. One is identifiability. Uh, so identifiability is a weird effect in charitable giving where people, even though objectively you help in both cases one child, people tend to give more money when that child is identified with a name and a photograph, uh, a name and a photograph, maybe a background story. So the objective, in some sense, the scope is the same, but you have stronger emotions, more empathy, more compassion to that identified victim and tend to give more. And uh, in some sense, that can be seen as overweighting of emotional and identifiable information, right? Here in Europe, uh, 2015, this picture of Island Kurdi flooded our social media completely. It really sort of overtook social media for a couple of days. I think all remember that picture because it was everywhere. It was this uh, Syrian boy who washed ashore in Turkey. And what we have here is data from the Swedish Red Cross who had started a campaign to raise money for Syria a couple of weeks before Island's picture. So on average, they got like 30,000 kroners a day. Then Island's picture came and they got three and a half million Swedish kroners in that day. And what's important to remember here, of course, is that there was information available about the need, just that that uh, information wasn't attended to and it didn't spark any kind of action. And then the other sad thing is sort of the half-life of empathy, which is shown here. That when Ilan's picture is no longer in your face in social media, people forget about Syria. So after here, it's not like we solved the problem, right? There are still children dying. So the objective information that's available here, if you just seek it out or don't avoid it, would, still, would tell you that there's thousands of islands. But just within a couple of weeks, we return to a pre-island uh, island level very quickly. And this is a dramatic effect, of course, uh, but it shows the power of, of emotion in motivating behavior, which is good. But it also shows that we're overweighting this information at the expense of other information. We don't care about the actual statistics. We care about the emotions evoked by this one child as it makes us want to act. So I think that's an interesting balance also that emotion often makes us want to act, but it also makes us insensitive to, to numbers and scope and, and things like that. So a balance between that seems important. Then we have this other weird effect. We had a question about the, the uh, Rottenstreich and she study, or she and Rottenstreich study with panels before, where you know you give the same amount to one versus four pandas. But there's this weird effect called singularity effect or compassion fate, where you actually give more to one than two. This doesn't work within subject. If you see both these helping projects side by side, you may want to um, help this. But if you do it in a between subjects design, quite clearly, many people feel strong empathy with this one person. And that empathy may, you may start to lose that empathy as the number of people in need increases, even if you uh, hold the effectiveness of helping constant. And interestingly enough, some research suggests that if you're better at down-regulating down your emotion, this effect may be even uh, stronger. So if you downregulate the feelings that you have, the voice and concern and compassion that you have for the many in need, but you maintain the good feeling that you have for the one that you can help here, uh, the singularity effect can be even stronger. So I think this is another example where there's a neglect. Of course, people are not only scope insensitive, there's a negative effect of scope. The more in need, the less you care. What's the solution then? Well, uh, we have a project with Peter Sinker and he says, well, it's the reason, of course, just you know, teach people about this and, and tell them how to do this or provide them with statistics. Highly numbered people, you know, effective altruists like to think about numbers. Well, 
turns out that if you add statistics to a single identified, so this is a study by Deborah Small, George Lowenstein, and Paul Slovic uh, for, from 2007. So this is the, a statistical child versus the identified child. So this is Rokia. She, <coughs> she's very famous. She's been in a lot of studies. Um, you see that as soon as we identify Rokia, donations increase. But if you have Rokia and combine that with statistics, so 3 million people are in risk of starvation from, from uh, 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 rainfall deficits that uh, has led to a drop in mice production. Well, so 3 million people face hunger. As soon as you add those statistics, donations drop. So you can't get people to be sensitive to the scope here just by adding statistics. Instead, what we think is happening is that the sort of empathy and compassion that you feel for the one that you can help now is somewhat lessened by the scope of the problem, that it's just a drop in the bucket, that it's hopeless. You know, there's three million people that, that will face uh, starvation. And we have done more studies on that. We, this is another weird term um, that we've invented called pseudo-inefficacy, where we show that this is also driven even only by system one sometimes. So, if you have a between subjects design, so one group of participants see the child Ophelo that you can help, and we ask them about Worm Glow, how good would you feel if you helped Ophelo, and how much would you donate? And then another group are asked the same thing. How would you feel about donating to uh, Ophelo, and how much would you donate? But they also see these other six identified children with a name and a photograph that can't be helped. So that's kind of slamming people over the head with the drop in the bucket. And it's an emotional hit as well. Like, it's okay, this kid will be helped, but he's six. Sorry, they have to die, more or less. Uh, then we see a very strong demotiv uh, demotivation effect. So the negative feelings from those helped decrease the good feelings for the one that you can help, reducing warm glow and reducing donations. So getting to the last part of my talk, the question is, how could we, all these examples that I've, I've shown here, information avoidance, information distortion, and, and neglect of or inattention to relevant information, how can we sort of fix that? That's a simple order, right? Well, we have a project where we're trying, I wouldn't call this a nudge, I would rather call it a boost for those who have read Tilgren Janoff and, and Ralph Hertwig's uh, work, but it's kind of a, a way of, using both system one and system two uh, to help people attend to information in a better way. So we call this introspection. So what we do is an introspection prompt. So we simply tell people that you can define this as you want to, or we define it to you, but what should matter for the decision that you make? So if we take the example with a child, so how much should your empathy for that child matter? And if it's a decision, the with statistics, how sh much should the scope of the problem matter, for instance? So we ask people to consider those attributes that's part of the decision problem. So we think that this simple uh, tool can broaden the scope of information that people consider. And it's, in a sense, a uh, system to a reasoning task that should in increase what people pay attention to. So we've done a, a few tests, both of pseudo-efficacy and singularity. So here's another weird study that we did then, looking at introspection. So this is all within subjects, and this is done in Sweden. So first, you, you're shown Rokia. Uh, we ask people, how much would you donate to help Rokia? We also endow people with money before that. How would you feel about donating to Rokia? Then, after you've made those ratings and said how much you want to donate, uh, you get information about Musa. Musa lives in a different country, but he has the same kind of issues as Rukia have. But because he's in a different country, the health organization can't help him. They're not in that country. So you're reminded about you know, some other child, irrelevant to this child in, in some sense, because it really can't be helped. And then we ask people again to rate. So, okay, now that you have this information, how do you feel about um, 
helping Rokia and how much money would you donate? And in one condition, which we call the introspection condition, we just insert something here. So a simple reminder that says that, okay, before you make the decision about how much money you want to donate to Rokia and how you feel about donating Rokia, think about how much your good feelings about helping Rokia should matter for your decision and how the negative feelings for the child, Musa, that can't be helped, should matter. So the idea is just here to make salient to people that these are two sort of competing emotional inputs. And hopefully that will reduce the negative, the motivating effect of, of the negative feelings that you have for not helping Musa. Uh, here's some unpublished data, but basically uh, we find this is before and after. So that means first time we measured donations and feelings. Second time we measured donations and feelings to Rukia. Uh, and uh, this bar is the introspection condition. We basically see a somewhat lower decrease of good feelings and a lower decrease of donations when we remind people to think about the, 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 the problem. The, it's a tiny effect, but it's, it's significant. The, the yeah. Like yeah, okay, so, so uh, here are feelings, here are, here are donations. Yeah, sorry. So intensity of, of positive feelings and donations in Swedish corners. Yeah, everybody did that in, in both. Yeah. So there, there's some evidence here that maybe we can counter, not completely, but to some extent, uh, the, the negative demotivating effect of uh, negative feelings for the kid that can't be helped. We have also done it for the singularity effect. This is a study together with Tehila Kugel and Paul Slovic and my grad student, Heidi Mocha, where we think that this preference for one versus many is both overweighting of the feelings that you have for the one that, but also underweighting the scope of the problem. So we did a study where participants between subjects either can help one or eight children. And typically what we find in those studies, if we just have that between subjects, is that people give more to one than eight children and that they have stronger empathy and compassion and distress for the one than eight. Uh, but then we also had two other conditions. We had the introspection condition and then what we call deliberation, which is simply uh, an instruction to think carefully before you make your decision. Uh, in the introspection condition, people were asked to think about how it's actually two attributes, but we broke that down to four. How much empathy and identification with either one or eight children should matter and how much the scope, how big the problem is, and the number of children should matter for your decision. And what we find, this is the control condition. This, the red is one child, and the, the black bar is eight children. So if we can replicate the singularity effect, you give more to one than eight. This is done in a Swedish study in this case, but we replicated also that study in Israel and, and in the US. We see that that pattern reverses for deliberation, just prompting people to think carefully, put them in a system two mindset, kind of wipes out that difference and almost reverses it. But we also really see the big increase here for, for the eight in the introspection condition. In fact, we also see that it's not that much reduced for one here. So it seems in this case that simply reminding people uh, to think about what should matter for you when you make this deci decision um, can dramatically change, or dramatically, to some extent, change the way that we attend to a very simple decision problem like this that just has two attributes, you know, the number of people and the, the feelings that you have for the people here. So, uh, we've done this in a bunch of sort of charity related situations. Overhead aversion is that people don't like charities to have any kind of, uh, any kind of, of um, um, overhead. Uh, proportion dominance is that we prefer to help a, a large proportion rather than an absolute large number of people. A beauty premium is that we tend to help beautiful recipients more than needy recipients. All of those effects can be reduced to some extent with introspection. But we also have, and I'm sorry that I don't have that here because that wraps up my talk very well. 
it can also increase motivated uh, reasoning, prominence, the kind of effect that I talked about earlier, where people uh, disregard human lives in favor of national security. Introspection can actually just be a justification. Yeah, sure. USA first. You know, don't risk it. So uh, I hope next time this conference is uh, that I can present some of that data. Okay, so uh, I just want to conclude that I think that there's these three components, this passive uh, neglect or inattention, this active avoidance, and also this distortion, which we can call motivated thinking, taking place when we make humanitarian and other decisions. It's driven both by cognition and emotion or system one and system two. And it might be possible to debias, but it is, I think, very difficult to debias some of those motivated reasoning effects if they do exist. If you want to learn more about this, uh, we have a website at Decision Research called Arithmetic of Compassion that I invite you to spend a lot of time on. It has features, this research and stories and, and kind of, uh, I think, uh, an interesting resource if you want to learn more about charitable giving. Okay, thank you. Hello, oh yes. Thank you so much. Thanks. Excellent, we have some time for questions, so. So, still reminding you that I'm not a number person, but I understood that uh, one is more than <laughs> is more than many, and yeah. it's yeah. Uh, but uh, but I've been um, recalling back to your website. You said there are lots of stories, and what I took from from your speech was yeah. that you talk about this identifiable information uh, about emotions, and you gave this um, this story about Ailan and the Red Cross and so on. And then I think about your speech, Ellen about narratives and facts ah. and here I take away that there's lots of emotions lots of stories and narratives in this uh, in your speech so how, how does this relate to Ellen's um, conclusions um, and then I thought about the way that you presented how we donate money now in December we have in Sweden this uh, music help and, and um, in Swedish radio and so on. Yeah. So how do we, so so in terms of what they can learn from from your research mm -hmm. in order for people to donate more money mm -hmm. uh, for that purpose, what would your sort of suggestion be? Yeah. Okay. So there's there's two questions. So so I think uh, the first question is how it relates to the conclusions that Ellen and Andrew. I think it's kind of the same. Uh, in a sense, because I, I, at the, if, if I understood Ellen's presentation correctly, you will have to correct me. I, I think we agree that we need emotion to energize behavior. I emphasize that a lot here, but I also think we need statistics. I mean, uh, really, what, what we show here with many of the, the sort of behavioral effects we see in charitable giving is that you neglect the important statistics. So, if anything, we need to combine the power of the emotion to motivate people to do something with a sensitivity to that information. Because the problem is that emotion leads to neglect or, or, or insensitivity to probability and scope. So that combination, I think, would be the most effective. I know that you agree with me. Or, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other question was what I would advise Charities. So we work a lot with a lot of we work a lot with charitable organizations, of course. They do all of this all the time already. Uh, what they do to a lesser extent is to do it systematically. So they don't know really what they do sometimes and they don't know what works. So what I advise them is just simple to, to do more sort of structured A and B field testing with these. I mean there's such a rich literature on on how to increase or decrease helping through social, emotional and, and analytical factors. Another question? Have you or any other uh, made any research about, uh, uh, for in, in Sweden for instance, or in the US, uh, w uh, how many people in person are, are, are using system one more than two and vice versa? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it depends on who you ask. I think all the people around me are just simple, simple system one people. Uh, but but no, uh, I mean, th that's a, first of all, it's kind of a false dichotomy. Uh, we're using that as, as a very simplified way of, of, of describing processing. 
and information processing. Uh, and second of all, I, I don't think that there's very strong traits so that I'm just a system one person, I'm just a system two person. There are individual differences, of course, like we saw with cognitive reflection or numeracy uh, in, in the abilities that you have, how much cognitive capacity you have, how much emotional abilities you have. But I mean, we don't, oh, I don't have a good answer to that other than that. Does Ellen? There's not a good answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's a false dichotomy, as Daniel says. Um, you, know, you, you can talk about along these individual differences, people who are lower in numeracy are going to use more of the prototypical system one thinking. But these are not stupid people. These are no. just people who tend to use more heuristic mm. processing. And people who are higher in some of these individual differences are going to use less of it. They're also not stupid people. They happen to know numbers a little bit better. But uh, it's one of false dichotomy, so you can't really say because it's a false dichotomy. And then two, people are a little bit of both. Yeah, I, I know that, uh, but I, I, I attended to a writing course some years ago, and then we, uh, we, we, we um, the teacher talked to us about a kind of model to, to, to analyze the targets, your target audience, mm -hmm. and he used a model, it might be Swedish, I don't know, Andersson, Hansson, and Svensson, and how they were, were, were related to facts and emotions. Uh -huh. okay. And he said that we, we are more fact people in Sweden nowadays. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know it's true. I mean, there are important and, and systematic cultural differences in, in how we express emotion and feel emotion and, and also how we value analytical thinking and so on. But, but I, yeah, that, I don't know that surname difference really. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Donny, I was, uh, uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. Thanks. I was, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you look at these studies that shows that people give less to six children or eight yeah. than to one, um, well, you can speculate that it has, you know, doesn't feel like you can do very much, right. but what would be the mechanism, why would we have such a, a heuristic that tells, tells us that? What would be, I mean, if you, if you find it so consistent, it should be something that is sort of hardwired, I don't know, at least you can ah. speculate that it is. Have you been thinking right. about that? So, first of all, I sure picked some data here, <laughs> so we don't find it so consistently. Yet. And in fact, there's uh, uh, several field studies that have failed to show this. Uh, I think we can produce it in the lab sometimes. Uh, so I'm not sure that it's such a strong, I mean, it's not a strong effect to begin with. It is an effect and we can sometimes show it. I, I think it has to do with a couple of things. One is that we actually don't like to, to see a lot of people suffering. We can't really, you know, multiply the suffering, but we know that oh, oh, sure it's bad when there's a lot of there's many people suffering. So we actually downregulate some of our feelings for the many, but also that that it's easy for me to empathize with one easier than with many. So it's easier for me just to kind of focus on your need now than to spread my my feelings across the room here. Yeah, and that's the critical thing. I think that was wondering why why is that? Why is it? Why does we? Why do we work like that? That's just. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that's just <laughs> one of the sort of mechanistic explanations we have. Yeah. But I'm sure Andreas can explain that in the break. Great talk. Thanks. Uh, so I had a question, uh, and it, it's going to be an opinion, because I don't, I don't think you've done work on this specifically. But you, you talked about that very interesting introspection manipulation, where you had people uh, focus on on specific attributes that were important in that decision, mm -hmm. and that's very much a, an information processing approach from from judgment and decision making. Yep. And I, I'm curious if you think that which of these would matter more, whether thinking about the attributes specific to the decision making situation would matter more, or getting people to think about more abstract values, oh. uh, like from like a values affirmation right. manipulation. Uh, in in a way, um, and or teaching people how to approach problems like that. Right. Like, does it have to be specific to the situation, or can it be uh, can it be a more general and maybe a more longer lasting kind of effect? Yeah, uh, that's how we envision the the idea of introspection to begin with. That it should be sort of general and, and applicable in in a lot of situations and long lasting. Though we haven't studied it in that way yet. We have done something which I think is relevant to what you're saying. It's not exactly that, but uh, 
So the examples that I showed here, we gave them the attributes, but we also had what we call free introspection. So you yourself have to come up with the attributes, actually write them down and then rate how important they are. And that's by far the more effective introspection method because it's really tailored to your preferences. Otherwise, we're capitalizing on us picking you know, what we think is relevant. So in a sense, I think that's somewhat related to what you said, that, that if you can, you know, assuming that you have this, this uh, the more abstract would include your goals and wishes and whatnot. Although you're still talking about it within that decision context. What's yeah, important yeah, to is, in this context? Yeah. And what I was thinking about was part of the way that you're emphasizing your studies is that people are overweighting some information, yeah. neglecting some information. Yeah. And if you can get them to abstract away from that situation altogether yeah. and think about what's important to me in my life, will that actually ultimately end up um, helping them to identify more quickly and efficiently? Well, that isn't important, and this is important. Yeah. It, it's a question. I don't, I, I don't know what the answer is. Well, well we, I think so. We've Again, this is another study, but, but if you take some of the moral arguments that, for instance, you know, Peter Singer talked about, that is kind of making a moral stance in the sense that this, you know, I should just donate more and I should do it to an effective cause. And, and, and I think those people that sort of subscribe to that idea, they, that effect is long lasting and they kind of go all in. So yeah. I would assume that it could extend to that yeah. as well. Yeah. Thank you. We have four people in like eight minutes. <laughs> All right, very quickly. I'd like to get back to the motivated reasoning yeah. study and um, the question that you are asking in the motivated right. reason yeah. uh, conditions. Uh -huh. um, because the question is sort of world directed. Uh -huh. You ask, is it yeah. likely or not that crime increased, yeah. blah, blah. Um, how do you exclude? Have you thought about excluding or how to do that, that people simply bring in a lot of prior reasoning and evidence that they take this to be a world directed uh, question? Like after seeing this study and all the other evidence that you have collected, blah, blah, how much, what, what do you think the likelihood of this is uh, increased crime, right? I mean, a slight uh, side remark as a, moderately numerate person, I found the question hard to interpret. Yeah, it is. Because it has this comparison at the yeah. end yeah. that seems to be irrelevant to yeah. whether something increased or not. So I was also wondering what the function of that addition to the question was right. actually. Right. right. Yeah, uh, uh, those are great questions. So I, I do think that that's just like Gordon said, this is kind of built in that you will have some differences between those that we call the Swedes and those that are world citizens in their priors about whether this will increase speakers. And that's kind of what's what's producing what's producing the effect as well. But we're also in addition, because we're doing experiments, we're kind of thinking that this should even out in the end. I mean even if you have that, those should go into different conditions unless there's systematic um, systematic effects that uh, that is associated with like worldviews and so on. So, and, and then the other question, yeah, uh, I'm going to blame Ellen and, and Dan Cajon because that's what they did. I, I agree with you. It's kind of a weird multi-stage thing where you first have to do the ratios and then you think you got the problem. And then you were asked to do, well, is it in, do you think it's likely to have increased or decreased? So I agree. I think it's a weird kind of question. But we were just replicating previous studies. <laughs> and all four cells are important, just like they are in yeah. other situations. Yeah. Well, uh, the thing th seems to be that if you can arrange the situation such that people think that they rescue one out of one sufferer, sufferer they, then, you, then they find, find it meaningless, meaningful. But if you think that they help one out of one million, they suddenly find it meaningless or less meaningful. Yeah. And the, people are inconsistent because I, I, I assume that I, we know that more than 80% of, of the Swedish voters really do vote. But m many of these people don't think it's meaningful to stop driving the cars because they're the only one. So they're basically inconsistent. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I can reveal a, 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 a piece of um, introspection to you. You know, uh, I used to give money to beggars and I didn't reach the saturation point. I just continued to do it 
although there were more and more beggars on the streets. And then we were, we began to be a host of a asylum seeking refugee for two years. And gradually I noticed that I was less willingness to give money to beggars. Yeah. And what was the reason behind that? It could be rational. Now I have found an efficient way to help people. Yeah. Or it could be an excuse. How would you interpret my, my behavior uh, <laughs> in, in view of these two possible interpretations? Uh, I think you should interpret it in the most favorable way that you can. Hello, <laughs> Sean. <laughs> I have a question about the concept of reasoning. Do you think it's possible to have reasoning without feelings and uh, activities and decision making? Um, well, that's many. Those are many different concepts. I, I do think, as in general, I think it's. I think we're a bit unclear what we mean with reasoning and reasoning and thinking. And uh, even though I'm a professor of cognitive psychology, I know that I will be out of a job soon because <laughs> cognition and emotion is merging and it's just, you know, everything. So, so I mean, I, I think that there's different forms of information processing that oftentimes, I mean, I think it's very hard to see a situation that's completely devoid of affect or completely devoid of cognition. Uh, for instance, I, I, I know some mathematicians and I can guarantee that uh, there is a lot of emotions and uh, activities and decision makings in, in the end of their reasoning yeah. activities. Yeah. Uh, so where is it possible to find the reasoning w without uh, emotions? Yeah, I don't know. And is it desirable is the question. What would that be? Have we ever seen that? Yeah. Spock maybe. <laughs> he was really wrong. <laughs> so it depends on what you go. Oh, do I have time? Oh, yeah. For a quick one. Thank you for a wonderful talk, uh, uh, Daniel. Um, w there's been a lot of talking about motivated uh, reasoning, and then you brought in motivated thinking. What do you think about uh, the motivated attention? Would that be sufficient to explain many of your, your, uh, your results? Yeah, I mean, attention is one of, you're an expert on that, I don't need to tell you, but attention is one of those other concepts that's just so sticky, it involves emotion and cognition and perception and everything, right? So, so yeah, sure, our manipulations are largely based on sort of shifting attention, and it's a JDM type of information process where attention is central, so yeah, sure, in a sense, but I also think that it's, even though I think we just started on that, but I do think that there's a strong sort of system one motivated thinking as well, which is sort of feeling infused. Mm, perfect, thank you so much. Thank you.